thank you all for turning out today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Martin Kalpavic. I'm the Associate Director here at Smithsonian Libraries and also the BHL Program Director. It's our great pleasure today to have Rod Page um, giving us a talk today. Um, for those of you who don't know Rod, does anyone not know Rod? Well, I'm going to read his bio anyway. Um, Rod's a professor of taxonomy at the University of Glasgow and is currently chairs the GBIF Science Committee. He's a lapsed taxonomist who, after working in phylogenetics, moved into biodiversity informatics. When not hacking code, he writes blog posts on why everything in the field sucks. So, but not Sam Adams. So Thanks. This, this is a slightly odd layout, so I'll, 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 I'll do my best. Thanks very much for, for having me. Uh, the title of this talk, I've been at a, a food security meeting uh, up at the National Agricultural Library. We're in a hotel. And I had this invitation to come here and give a talk, and I was struggling to think of what to talk about. So lots of Sam Adams was consumed while uh, I was writing this, and it's going to show. This is going to be an incredibly disconnected talk. I want to touch on, I guess, about five things that sort of keep me awake at night, and hopefully some of these will intersect with some of the things that you're interested in. So let's see what happens. I'll try not to use the laser, but it's going to be fatal. OK, um, the first thing I want to show is um, a couple of graphs. This is a graph of the numbers of new animal names published over time. It comes from Thomson Reuters ION database. And there are a couple of things you can see there. I've sort of highlighted World War I and World War II. World War II obviously had a big impact on the names. Uh, 1923, the infamous Mickey Mouse copyright cutoff. Big implications for BHL. The thing that I find really interesting about this diagram is without lasering anybody. So, well, that didn't work whoa, that doesn't work at all, that sort of horizontal line on the right-hand side. So since, I guess, about the 70s onwards, the number of new animal species or new animal names that have been coined has been pretty much static. It's kind of flatlined. So that, I find that kind of interesting. So you could look at that kind of diagram and come up with all sorts of explanations. So these are some of the things that people have come up with. Uh, maybe it reflects the fact that taxonomists are working at capacity. Maybe there's so much biodiversity there, and we're struggling to sort of keep up. So we're well, basically, if, you know, there's a finite number of people working. That's where we are. Some people um, have argued that maybe we're running out of species to discover. That perhaps it reflects the fact that the job's almost done. But whatever interpretation you have, the really striking thing is that the vast majority of information about organisms is in the past. And what I mean by that is there are about 16,000 odd new animal names that pop up every year. So this time next year, we'll have added a small chunk of information. The vast majority of information about biodiversity in the taxonomic literature is legacy. You can contrast that with sequences. This is a really old and grotty slide. But the idea here is this kind of classic thing. We've all seen this idea that, that gem bank is growing exponentially. So the scale on this graph is logarithmic, and sequences are just going through the roof. So we've got these two very, very kind of different kind of patterns. So on the left, this is what taxonomists are doing. We're sort of boxing along, describing essentially the same number of species every year. People doing sequencing, it's just going exponential. So I'm going to try and sort of summarize that with this. So these are two very different patterns. And one thing that kind of I ponder about is what's the best way to kind of respond to that? So if you're a researcher in this field, what, what would looking at that diagram tell us to do? So one response might be to think, OK, all the action is clearly in sequencing. Sequencing is where we should be, and we can do all sorts of funky kind of things there. So if you're going to talk about sequences, you're going to think about phylogeny, about evolutionary trees. And this is an area that I used to be really heavily engaged in. I really haven't done anything meaningful in this area for a long, long time. But there's one topic I'm still really interested in, and it's this perennial kind of issue of visualization. Um, it seems to me we still haven't really cracked the best way to display and interact with evolutionary trees. This is um, the latest contender. This is one zoom. How many people have come across one zoom? One zoom .org. Yeah. It's very, very slick. It's very kind of nice. It's getting a lot of kind of interest from people interested in, in community outreach of evolutionary trees. I hate it. I loathe it with a passion. Um, and the reason for that is it seems to me to incredibly distort the evolutionary tree. So if you look at mammals, it's, it's a gorgeous kind of fractal kind of pattern. But the first kind of split in mammals is this huge branch coming off down the bottom. Those are monotremes. That's the platypus and the spiny anteater. So these, these are the echidna. 
That's a tiny fraction of mammal diversity. You look at that, you have no notion that the vast majority of mammals are bats and rats. It sort of seems incredibly kind of distorting. So I still think there's this kind of goal of how do we best display the tree of life. So I occasionally come back to this and hack together something that looks a bit crude. So I really like the idea of zooming in and zooming out. This is a toy I've been sort of working on. Obviously, there's a lot of work where you have a big tree. I think this is reptiles, maybe. I think this is the tree of all reptiles. What I really want is a kind of visualization that you can do some work with, in a sense. I want to be able to zoom in. I want to be able to see the branches and go and get some detail. And it seems to me that we're sort of caught between visualizations that are kind of fun to interact with, but you can't actually learn much from, can't do any kind of work with, and, and sort of visualizations like this, which are desperately kind of unfinished. So I'm interested in, in evolutionary tree visualizations that you can do some things with. One of the things I'm sort of interested in, in thinking about is um, DNA barcodes. So barcoding is clearly you know, a big thing. This is about 2 million barcodes stuck on a map, the publicly available DNA barcodes. The thing that sort of visualizations like this, this is very similar to the kind of visualization that GWIF might make, is it's basically dots on maps. So what could we do that's more interesting and, and, and more useful than just sticking dots on maps? And so one thing I'm really interested in is can we combine these kind of visualizations, this is where all the data comes from, with evolutionary trees. So my latest attempt to do this, this is another toy. Uh, these are the Banza katydids in Hawaii. So this is an example that's been used. Lots of people have used this for sort of 3D visualizations of phylogenies. So it seems to me there'd be enormous scope for somebody to play with something like DNA barcodes, combine them with evolutionary trees, and do some kind of interactive phylogeography, where instead of just saying, OK, there's dots on maps, this insect occurs in Hawaii, you've got the evolutionary tree. You can sort of look at that and think in terms of you know, the classic scenarios of island hopping, young islands on the right, older ones on the left, and so on. So one thing that I'm sort of kind of interested in is, is what's the best kind of ways to visualize and interact with the tree of life. <clears throat> so one response to that kind of diagram is to engage with sequences. If sequencing is not your thing, then what are we going to do about poor old taxonomy? And I'm a taxonomist at heart in many ways. I started out doing crab taxonomy in New Zealand many years ago. So why are sequences cool? Sequences are cool, I guess, because it's, it's information that's born digital. You can compute with it. You can do a lot of stuff you can do that you can't easily do with traditional kind of taxonomy. So one approach is to sort of try and make taxonomy as digital as we possibly can. And that's inspired um, some work to sort of, I guess, sort of make the taxonomic literature more kind of accessible. And I guess the reason I'm here is, is BHL very kindly sort of invited me along. I'm sure everybody knows about BHL. So one of the things I've been interested in is when I first encountered BHL, I had two kind of reactions to it. One is it's, it's full of old stuff, and there were plants, and who cares about plants, really? Um, and there were no articles. So certainly, uh, you know, as a practicing scientist and certainly as a, as a zoologist, the unit of work is an article. So I set about figuring out how could you get articles in BHL, and that led to the project you can see on the left, which is Biostore which is one of my little toy projects that sort of graduated slightly beyond toy to being sort of vaguely kind of usable. So what I'm interested in is, is finding the original descriptions of these species and making them available so we can actually have a look at them. This led to um, another project called Bionames. So this is, I guess there are a small number of people in the world who um, their goal is to get all the names of every living animal or plant, put them in some sort of place, and, and then do something useful with them. And I'm, I'm one of those sad people. The goal behind this project is, could we get every animal name that's ever been published and link it to the original description? So you can actually go and see the original taxonomic description. At the moment, there's something like five million names there. About one and a half million are linked to a publication in the terms of somebody gives you a bit of text saying it's in this journal. That's not good enough for the 21st century. We should be able to actually go and read that thing. So about 454,000 are linked to a digital identifier. So maybe a DOI for a publication. Maybe there's a link to BHL or Biostore so you can go and read it. And the goal here is that ideally I'd like everything linked in that way. So at the moment, you've got maybe a one in four chance. If, if there's a publication in that database, you actually better go and read it or get out your credit card and go and read it. So I'm really interested in trying to sort of link names to that kind of original kind of literature. And then we can sort of do some kind of interesting things with that. 
So this brings me on to what's going to probably seem like a colossal detour. Um, the kind of stuff that I've shown you so far, the sort of BHL, the Biostore kind of stuff, in many ways is incredibly traditional about how we think about scientific publications. It's essentially, there's this huge kind of taxonomic literature, it's wonderful, let's get access to it and have a look. Maybe there are ways to kind of rethink the way we sort of do publications. So here comes the detour. How many people have heard of Ted Nelson? A couple of people. So I don't really do the kind of intellectual hero thing, but this guy is a really kind of interesting kind of person. So way back in the 60s, so we're talking before personal computers and certainly before the internet, Ted Nelson was writing about hyperlinks and hypermedia. He's the person who coined this idea of, of the hyperlink. And he talked about this bizarre concept of transclusion and he had the system which was going to link all the world's information, and he called it Xanadu. And he'd write these extraordinary self-published articles. It's kind of like, if anybody has heard of Leon Croizat, I used to be a big Croizatian fan many years ago, he's kind of like the sort of Croizat of the World Wide Web. Now, of course, very few people have heard of this guy, but probably a lot of us have heard of this guy, um, Tim Berners-Lee. So Tim Berners-Lee is a guy credited with founding the web. So Tim was working in CERN and Switzerland, and he came up with, let's have these things called web pages, we're going to have HTML, we're going to have this, this way of naming websites, the URL, the links we all use, and he figured out how to sort of make that work, and he built the World Wide Web. Now these are two very kind of different approaches to essentially the same kind of problem. So the, the method that worked, that we also have adopt now, is the World Wide Web. And the way this sort of thing works is you have a web page, and the, all the kind of linking that we have between different web pages is very much one direction. So if I make a website and I link to some other web, website, that other website doesn't know it's being linked to. There's no notion of citation built into it. So one of the sort of big kind of complaints you might have, if you put, put up a website, it's very hard for you to find out who's linking to you. As far as Tim is concerned, when you have a link from one page to another, um, if the other page goes away and the link breaks, that's not his problem. So we have this classic kind of 404 issue. We all go click on links and they break. That for him, not my problem. And so he built this incredibly kind of simple system and it just took off and we now have the web. Ted Nelson, bless him, hates the World Wide Web. He loathes it with a passion. Even though everybody kind of credits him as kind of one of the early founders of the web, he cannot stand this. He wants to remove it completely and start again. And he had a really kind of different system in mind. What he wanted to have was a system where things would be linked together by a kind of two-directional link. So every time you make a link to something, the thing you link to would know it's being linked to. So there's built-in kind of citation. So if you create a web page and somebody links to you, you would know that. What he also wanted is he didn't sort of have this idea that a link would be, you sort of get you know, shot off to some other kind of website. He imagined a situation, if you're, say, doing something, writing something, and you want to use information from another website, like you're going to use some text or something, you'd actually essentially literally embed that work from the source into your own work. So instead of a link pointing to it, you'd actually essentially copy, not even copy it, actually literally embed that information in there. So you sort of imagine this kind of world where all the information was closely kind of linked, you could always track down the source of any particular statement, and none of these links broke. So he imagined a system called Xanadu, and it never really got built. This is the closest he ever got. And what you're seeing here is, you see one of these sort of white columns is a document, and if you refer to another document, say you're quoting a bit of text, you're actually literally going to that other document, grabbing that text and putting it in your document. Probably the nearest thing we have to this today, if you say you're on Facebook and you're going to um, show a video, and you say paste in a YouTube link, when somebody looks at that page, the video itself is not on Facebook, it's over in YouTube. So he imagined doing that for everything, for every sort of document you'd actually kind of see. So, so at this point you're probably wondering, what the hell? So I sort of have a soft spot for Ted Nelson because I kind of think that what the system he sort of had in mind is actually very close to the kind of system that some people working in taxonomy have been trying to build in a way. And it turns out that we've actually been building something very like what Ted Nelson's been talking about. So let me give you an example. So um, I'm not a botanist, but um, botanists are sort of doing something very close to Ted Nelson's kind of vision. So this is um, a description of a plant. It's an article in Biostore, so it comes from BHL. 
And you, you go to read this paper and you'll see you know, pictures and you'll see some text of this description. So botanists also do floras. And what seems to happen is when you do a flora, you basically go to a particular part of the world and you say, these are the species that are there and you bring in all these kind of descriptions. So there's a flora called Flora Malesiana, a very famous um, series of volumes for the flora of, I guess, what's now modern day in Indonesia. And this is the entry for that species in this flora. And this is going to look incredibly familiar because that picture there is literally that picture that's in that article. And virtually all the text in that flora is verbatim copy from the original article. So this is the kind of thing that Ted Nelson was kind of talking about, this idea that you sort of incorporate this earlier work and sort of repurpose it in the secondary kind of work. So a flora is basically almost like a cut and paste and sort of reassemble of the article into this kind of new sort of composite kind of thing. And the way Ted Nelson would envisage this is that it wouldn't just be like a, a cut and paste job. The actual image that's in the flora would be served from the article and the text would come directly from the article. And so you've got this kind of wonderful kind of built-in provenance. If you want to find the source of that information, it's already embedded in there. We've got this kind of built-in citation. So it seems to me there's lots of kind of potential for rethinking the way that we do these kind of publications. And we could even go further. So if you look at this description, there's a diagram on the left. You look at the individual kind of bits. The person who did the illustration refers to the specimens. And you can actually go now online, and the one on the right is a photograph of the specimen. I'm pretty sure the little bit that I've highlighted are those, I guess those are fruits, um, are what's been drawn on the left. So we can even imagine drilling further down. So in a sense, what would be really nice is if you're looking at that picture on the left, you can maybe click on that bit and go straight to the original specimen, or even the part of the specimen that has that kind of information. So we're sort of starting to link these things back to the original kind of data in some way. And so maybe we could imagine not just linking to the pictures, but maybe having some data in between that. So if somebody mentions a specimen, instead of just having, say, a link to the picture, you'd actually have a link that says, here's the data and the information about that kind of specimen. So these articles on the left become not just a bit of text that we read, but a whole sort of aggregation of data. And each element, each illustration, we can trace back to the original source, in this case, ultimately, to the original kind of specimen. So I think that's kind of what Ted Nelson sort of was imagining in the digital world. And I think, in a sense, we have sort of lots of these kind of um, things that are going on already, potentially, with taxonomic information. So maybe Ted Nelson, he's, now, he's still around. He's a very grumpy old man. He writes extraordinary books, um, castigating Bill Gates and all sorts of people. Um, and he talks about how he was robbed. And it's, it's quite, he's very Crozettian in many ways. Um, but he's still incredibly influential. He's one of these people that, that people really sort of, sort of quote. And there's another thing he was really interested in doing that I think is going to take off. So Ted Nelson envisaged not only all these kind of deep connections between different kind of documents that you could sort of trace, but a web in which you could go and annotate anything that you were interested in. And there's a company that's sort of trying to sort of do something with this. So the idea is you could have any sort of thing you're looking at, say this article on, on the left, you could go and select bits of text and add annotations. Those annotations could be comments, they could be bits of data, they could be all sorts of things. How many people have heard of hypothesis? Spelt bizarrely with a dot s or an underscore dot s. This is a really interesting project. That their mission is basically to make the web um, completely annotatable, in a sense. So anything you're looking at, being a web page or a PDF, you could potentially make some comments, add some annotations. Now, one reason I think this, this project is going to be quite interesting is they've started to sign up lots of science publishers. And their goal is that most of the major science publishers, if you're reading a paper online, you'd have the ability to add comments. Now, there's various kind of ways I guess you can add comments. So a classic thing might be you know, the yellow highlighter that you can do in PDFs and that sort of thing. But I think there's some more interesting things you can kind of do. So let's give you an example. On the left, this is a bit of text from a paper. It's describing a new species of mammal. And on the right is this little interface that a hypothesis gives. So basically, they can embed this on any web page you like. If you can see it on the web, see it in a web browser, you can get this annotation tool. And what I've done here is I just sort of selected the species name, obviously. There's a latitude and longitude pair. Um, there's some specimen codes. That's a Chicago uh, Natural Museum, and so on. Now, that in itself isn't terribly exciting, but what you can also do is all those annotations that have been made, and this is the case was made by two different people, 
you can group together. And so you can start to do things with this, this paper that, say, the original authors haven't done. So say the people who wrote that paper didn't give you a map. It'd be kind of nice to have a map. If they've got latitude and longitude in there. If you can get that information, you can make a map. So one thing I did is there was a little hackathon in Edinburgh a few months ago, and I had a couple of people sitting down and annotating these papers, grabbed all the annotations together, and sort of said, basically, OK, what can we do with this? So these are all the comments that we made on those papers. So pulling out things like taxonomic names and localities and things. And from that, you can generate a map. So now we know what part of the world we're talking about. Um, I think this is a new species described up a volcano in um, Java. Lots of different species are mentioned. What are these things? Who knows? You go to EOL, you can get some pictures, and suddenly you can see, OK, I now know where in the world this is. I know what this paper is about. And you can do all this completely independently of the original authors, in a sense. So there's a lot of scope for adding kind of information to this kind of stuff. You could add information that suggests maybe some, some record is erroneous. You can, if somebody gives a locality but not latitude and longitude, you could add that. And there's this kind of idea of having this sort of public repository of this sort of information. So I think this is probably going to be coming to a journal near you, the hypothesis um, thing. I know BHL is sort of considering looking at it. I've been trying to get GBIF kind of interested in playing with this as well. But the idea that instead of the literature being this kind of static thing that you just have to sort of look at and can't sort of edit or annotate publicly, I think that's going to start to change. A couple more topics. Um, this is the biodiversity knowledge graph. Um, so I just briefly want to sort of talk about this. So this is sort of one of the things that I fantasize about being that, that we would have one day. It's the idea that wouldn't it be lovely if we could connect all the dots? So that if we could connect literature to um, taxonomy, which is kind of what the BioNames project is about, that we could connect literature to specimens. So every time a specimen has been mentioned in the literature, we'd have that link. That we could trace back every sequence to its voucher specimen, and so on. So I'm really interested in, in, in how we'd go about assembling this kind of graph, because I think it, it would enable all kinds of interesting kind of questions. Because many of the kind of sort of basic questions in biodiversity, we're fundamentally joining the dots in that graph. So if you want to make, say, uh, a phylogeny appear on a map, like I showed earlier, you need some sequences. You need to know where the sequences came from. So if you found the specimens and if they were georeferenced, you could then join the dots. I've got a sequence, I've got a tree, I've got a dot on a map. I can do phyl phylogeography. So I'm not going to talk in great detail about this. There's a kind of little research note I sort of wrote about sort of saying, wouldn't it be cool if we had this? One thing that kind of interests me is, is how would this actually happen? I'm trying to think about how we could sort of build this. Now it occurs to me that we have this part of this already. So over on the left hand side there's <coughs> publications, people and journals. So we have really good identifiers for publications. We have DOIs. We have identifiers for people now, orchids. How many people have got an orchid? A few people, yeah. So orchids are these um, globally unique identifiers for researchers. And research agencies and some publishers are advocating that we all get these. In fact, there are some journals, like Seedlings Royal Society of London, you cannot publish in unless you get an orchid. And the idea is that it enables you to uniquely identify yourself, and there's some sort of tools being built up around that. So, for example, instead of having to build your CV, you can go to ORCID. ORCID links these to the DOIs for your papers. It automatically knows all the kind of research that you've done. You're uniquely identified. So we're now in a situation where we have publications are identified. Uh, there's a lot of interest in linking publications to publications, citations, and linking publications to people. Now, of course, the, some of these things are there for a reason. So the citation to citation links exist because there's money in that. So Web of Knowledge um, use that information commercially. Google Scholar uses it to rank publications and so on. The link between ORCID and publications that's being driven I guess by um, institutions and funding agencies wanting to know what we're doing. It gives them a way to automatically figure out how many papers have you published, uh, what institutions, what grants did they come from, and so on. So the bit on the left kind of exists, and it's been driven by money. It's been driven by value. So I do wonder, if we want to get the rest of this thing to actually do some interesting science, not caring so much about publications and people, what would be sort of drivers that we could kind of use. So, because I think there's some cool scientific questions you could tackle if you had all these links. You could, you know, think about 
geography and sequence evolution and traits of organisms and so on. One thing might be, so I guess being a museum, museums always have to kind of justify their existence and their funding. How would you measure impact? One way might be, I've got all these collections, how many times have they been sequenced? How many times have they been cited in the literature? So I do wonder whether maybe one way we could sort of drive building part of this is say if we had services that for any museum in the world could tell you the impact of your collection. I know I've seen, you know, there have been panicked emails in Taxicom about this. My manager needs a list of everything that's ever been done this year based on my collection. Can we have that tomorrow, please? So given that there might be some value in that, um, financial or otherwise, maybe that sort of thing could be something that we could be kind of, kind of built. So I'm just showing that there's kind of something to sort of think about. I'd love this to exist. The challenge is going to be how do you kind of engineer that to sort of happen. Now, last totally disconnected topic, um, GBIF. How many people have heard of GBIF? <laughs> cool. I, I ask that question a, a lot and quite often not so much um, of a response, particularly among students, quite interestingly. So I've become involved in, in GBIF. Um, and I sort of, it's quite ironic really, because I used to write a lot of blog posts about how bad the data was in GBIF. Um, so now I'm sort of involved, I'm trying to figure out how you sort of tackle this. So I think there are all sorts of issues um, that, that are sort of behind this. And some of these issues are more general than just GBIF. So GBIF is a kind of truly Byzantine organization. Um, the way it works in terms of data is you have data typically, say, from museum or herbarium or some other organization. Uh, before that data goes into GBIF, it has to be approved at some sort of national level. So GBIF is all about national organizations before data gets, gets in there. So you have a collection, the data is digitized, it goes into GBIF. Now inevitably, something might be wrong with the data. And then the question is, so how would you fix an error? And what tends to happen is somebody, I guess the model is, you find a mistake, GBIF will send you an email saying there's something wrong and it gets fixed. And in my experience, this just fails completely. It's sort of, it's based on a whole bunch of assumptions, but a big assumption is that the museums or institutions that have that data have the resources to go and fix the data. It assumes that there's a team of people cleaning the data and can sort of tackle this. Now, in some cases, that's true. But I think in the vast majority of cases, it's not. Certainly, in many of the small institutions, there's nobody around who's going to sort of be able to expand that effort to clean the data. Quite often the data is published as a kind of one-time thing. It's like we've ticked a box, data published in GBIF, tick, and off it goes. So this can lead to some big problems with data quality and not an obvious mechanism for fixing it. Or the mechanism that people, everybody says they prefer, please send the errors back to the data provider, doesn't work because when you do that, the data provider doesn't do anything with it. So that's one sort of major kind of problem. Another problem is that there's huge gaps in the data. And this is an example that I came across recently that I thought was really kind of alarming. So the Zika virus, a huge publicity, mosquito-borne virus, um, lots of news reports coming out of Brazil, and there are two, spe two species of mosquito implicated. So very high-profile thing, and these are very high-profile mosquitoes. So I went to GBIF to have a look at what GBIF could say. And according to GBIF, all these news reports coming out from Brazil are clearly bogus, because the mosquito doesn't live there. And this was sort of slightly alarming. So this is the best that our sort of best global infrastructure for biodiversity information could tell us. The mosquito doesn't exist there. Now, of course, that's completely nonsense. And it turns out there's an extraordinary data set that's open access, that's been published in a repository, I think, run by the journal Nature, that had a huge amount of information on this mosquito. And so I went and grabbed that and stuck it in, and suddenly, here we are, and you can see this mosquito is, you know, through very widespread, it does occur in Brazil, it's doing its best to invade um, the United States, and so on. So that's kind of crazy in a sense, that this sort of global database can't tell you um, information about clearly a really kind of important and topical kind of organism. Now, I managed to get that data in because, you know, I have a sort of relationship with GBIF and I could click a few buttons and do that. But there's an issue about how do you... If you're not, if you haven't got that kind of relationship, how do you get this kind of important data in there really, really quickly? There's a huge kind of bureaucratic process to getting data in, which makes GBIF kind of fairly kind of slow and unresponsive. So I guess I'm really interested in ways of getting data more quickly into GBIF, and also this general problem of fixing errors in data. 
And it occurs to me one sort of approach to sort of doing this is to maybe kind of rethink the way we treat data. Are there any programmers in the house? Any software developers? Anybody? There's, there's, there's a couple who may admit to it. There's one. So this is kind of the idea that maybe we should think of data very much how programmers think of source code. There's a tradition now in, in programming that everything is open, all the code is in the open. So if you write some, some software source code, you put it, in this case, typically in a project called GitHub, and the code's available for everybody to look at. And let's say that software doesn't quite do what you want it to do. Um, you can contact the person who wrote the code and say, I, I'd like to fix it to do this. And the person can say, sure, that's fine, uh, I'll, I'll do that. Or the person could ignore you, or the person might be dead. In which case, you can actually copy that code, make your own copy of it, and do it in the changes that you want. And now you've got, for example, the original kind of code, and you've got an edited version. Maybe that version is better. So that seems, that's entirely kind of accepted within the open source community. This idea of if you have the code, you can fork it. Everything is traceable, so everybody knows where it originally came from, and everybody's edits and contributions are incredibly explicit. But it's all there, and if it doesn't do what you want it to do, you can fix it, you can change it. I think it would be great if we could do the same for data. So there are lots of cases where we, where we have data, say data in GBIF. Classic problem might be somebody's uploaded a data set, they've mislabeled the latitude and longitude columns, the map is clearly nonsense. Uh, the people who uploaded the data, they've moved on, they're not interested, you can't fix the data. So GBIF doesn't have decent information. All it would take is somebody to grab the data, switch the labels around, and suddenly we have a map. And so what I think is, is maybe we should start thinking of data as not this kind of immutable thing, and not necessarily this thing that the data providers control and have the final say over, but there's something that we can release and then people can kind of edit. Now this potentially could have lots of benefits for the provider because you might not have the resources to fix the data, but if somebody fixes it for you, there's nothing stopping you going and grabbing the modified copy and bringing that back in and saying, right, we've got this modified cleaned up copy, we're going to build on that. So I think we need to have some, a bit of a rethink about the way we treat data. We need to treat it much more in the same way that we sort of treat open source software development. Okay. So I hope there's a prize for the most discombobulated, diverse set of non-connected topics. Um, so these are the things I've sort of been thinking about recently. I'm really interested in this sort of relationship between DNA sequencing, I guess particularly DNA barcoding and taxonomy. They seem to be on two totally different kind of trajectories. What's the best way to sort of think about that? Visualization. Um, there's so much I think we can still do on visualizing evolutionary trees, particularly doing interesting things with them and making them visualizations that we can do some actual work with. The whole nature of, of publication is changing dramatically. I haven't even talked about ideas such as micro-publications, the idea that an individual figure could be a publication, an individual edit to a database could become a publication. The biodiversity knowledge graph, which doesn't exist but looks kind of nice. Um, I think there's enormous scope. Again, it's a classic kind of mantra. If we had everything linked together, we could do cool stuff. There seems to be a huge challenge in actually making those links. And finally, data is becoming incredibly important. I think we're moving to a case where people are happy to have data in the open. Data is becoming citable. People now get DOIs for data. Um, but we still sort of treat it as this kind of thing that the provider has some sort of special privileges over, which I think is holding us back um, seriously, certainly from the perspective of organizations like GBIF. Thanks so much for your time. Um, so I'm kind, I'm kind of a, how shall I put this? I like the idea of linked open data. I think a lot of the stuff that goes with it is kind of gets in the way of the basic kind of idea. And I think as a, as a community, we've spent a lot of time on vocabularies and identifier wars, LSIDs and that kind of stuff that sort of have got in the way. So I'm really keen on the links. I'm really interested in how you make the links. Um, I guess I, phrases like the semantic web, web I tend to run away from because it's, one of, it's the classic vaporware. It's, so Tim Berners-Lee, when he gave us the web, he said this was kind of like version you know, 1.0. The real web is going to be this web of data called the semantic web. And everybody's kind of talked about the semantic web. It's coming real soon now, and it kind of, kind of hasn't. 
In terms of the specimens in the literature, so this is one thing that I've been really interested in the context of, say, BHL, because if you have access to the text, you can go back and text mine those citation, the specimen codes. And I did a little experiment where you can, you can build kind of league tables of which museum has the most kind of cited collection. Now, I guess there's, there's possibly a danger in that, because once you have a metric, people are going to try and optimize that. But I think from my point of view, it would be wonderful for any particular specimen. So imagine going to GBIF or any kind of site that has a specimen. How many times have people mentioned that in the literature? What have they said about it? Has there been a discussion of what the identity of that thing is? And so on. And all that requires is us to mine the literature for these museum codes and then link those to the specimen database and to the literature. I guess that's going to work really well for vertebrates and other groups where there's a culture of citing specimen codes. My sense is entomology doesn't so much. It tends to be it's in some collection. And then botanists are a law unto themselves because they tend to cite um, collectors and collector codes rather than things. So there's going to be a huge challenge of making that mapping. If there is a culture of citing specimens in a certain kind of way, then it's just a question of locating that in text. And we can already locate taxonomic names. We could locate those. And then there's, there are tools emerging around GBIF that you can sort of take this code and try and map it to what GBIF has, and then you've got some sort of link. And if, if say, GBIF has, I think they do, they store the ARCs as well, then you can make that kind of connection. Right. So I think it's, it's, it's going to happen, it's just going to require a bit of sort of futzing. The challenge is, like with most of these things, going forward, you can use the identifiers. Sure. It's the same with the literature. There's, so when you write papers, most people hopefully now start to stick in the DOI for the article. We don't fuss around with how you format it. The journal takes care of that. But going back retrospectively, before DOIs became a thing, you've got to mine the literature and make those kind of links. Um, but I think it's doable. Yeah, I mean, six, six million is a lot, so there are scalability issues. But, but if, for example, that was source code, you could see exactly what the changes were. And so if you made some changes and somebody else made some changes, then you can reconcile them. You can see whether they're compatible with each other. So maybe somebody at GBIF edited one bit of that record and you edited something else. If they're, if they're compatible, they'd merge together. So I mean, I, I, I use GitHub as an example of that. It's not really designed for big chunks of data. It's designed for fragments of text. Um, but I think there's a lot of scope for having some system like that. I mean, the case where you are clearly actively engaged and can edit it is one situation. My suspicion is for lots of data, that isn't the case. There's just nobody at home to, to do that. Um, and presumably, you might find some of the edits that other people might make helpful. Some of them, of course, you might not. And you could reject those as well. Um, but we just need to scale that to handle 6 million records at a time. So, so I guess one issue is, is, is who wants it? Why do we want it? So the people who really want it are, for example, GBIF. Because GBIF has a mission to organize all the global information on biodiversity. So they have a vested interest in having it. Um, but if you're um, a taxonomist, what's your interest in having a global classification? Because the chances are, if, you, if you've got a global classification, it's not going to agree with you. So I guess the question is, what's, what's the driver for having one? So I think organizations that think globally will have a very strong driver. Then I guess you've got attempts like the Catalog of Life, which they sort of institutionalize this whole kind of process of trying to do it, and that seems incredibly kind of slow. So I think there's kind of a lag kind of effect. So I guess given that we're, we're not a tightly integrated community, that there's very few strong drivers for having a, a global background classification, apart from organizations like GBA or say NCBI in terms of the sequences. Maybe it's not that surprising. There's an abstract idea that it would be a good thing to have, yeah. but that doesn't really motivate people. So I think there are some organizations like I guess EOL and NCBI and GBIF for whom it is a big deal because they need to provide navigation. But then, okay, do taxonomists think that helping those organizations achieve that goal is something they should be doing? I suspect many of them probably don't see it like that. So I wonder whether it's kind of a, an abstract good with no clear rationale for doing it unless you are part of those organizations. We have a very strong rationale for doing that. Because I suspect there are probably quite valid reasons why it hasn't happened. And maybe the, the, the drivers are just not there.
there are two ways to think about it. One is to get Jim back to change the whole notion that if if you're not the original provider, you can't fix the record. Um, or maybe we add some layer on top of it. So if you think about that sort of idea of having data in the open. So I always thought it'd be great to have a website called ginbankwatch.com or something that would, you could put in a, yeah, you'd put in a sequence, a uh, session number, it would tell you if anybody had flagged that. I mean, because I know what you mean. I mean. When I was editing systematic biology, you'd, you'd get these reviews coming in and people would say, well, these sequences are wrong. So the person would go, oh, okay, and they'd redo the analysis. But that information, the sequences were wrong, became folklore but never published anywhere. It's very rare to see somebody assert directly in print the sequence is wrong. I've done that. Yeah. Won't yeah. Unless the original so I guess that would be an argument for either some sort of annotation system. Because there's nothing stopping you, for example, firing up Hypothesis and adding that. So if anybody else had the same software, they could see that it was a problem. Or having some sort of site dedicated to calling them to account. Um, or long term, going to some sort of open editing kind of thing. But I know, I know it's, it's deeply frustrating. I guess the only thing on the plus side is, given because of sequences, I'd argue it's easier to find the errors because if a sequence appears in the wrong part of the tree, you've got an issue. There are lots of cases where errors are much harder to see because how would you, how would you know if it was wrong? I think there are a couple of things happening. So one thing is the, um, the kind of very rich publications that, that pin off to publishing. So zoo keys and micro keys and fighter keys. So this idea that your publication, if you've got a species name in it, you mark it up as that. If you've got a specimen code, you mark it up and you link it. So as you're generating a publication, it becomes much kind of richer. Part of the challenge that is that can be hard work. Um, I don't publish many papers anymore. I sort of blog, which is career suicide. But so I, I was publishing a paper recently, and I, it was incredibly bureaucratic and onerous to sort of fill in all these boxes. In the good old days, you just type some nonsense and you send it off. And, um, so the more kind of annotation and markup you add, I mean, the danger is it's going to be a tedious process to do. But if you look at a, um, a recent article in ZooKeys or Fighter Keys, the, the kind of links they have, basically you can generate auto-generate maps, you can interpret the specimen data. So one approach is, is to have a much more rigorously kind of marked up kind of text. I think another thing we're going to see is the very nature of publication is going to change. So people are talking about micro publications and nano publications. So, um, so one, approach, one approach is ultimately many of the things we're dealing with are, are, are facts, little, little statements. What we tend to do is write a whole bunch of prose and there's information in that and at some point we try and figure out what does it actually mean. What if we started publishing facts like the species is found here. Its sequence is this. Um, and maybe those are the smallest kind of units we can actually do some work with. So maybe we could start citing those. So there's some interest, particularly in the bioinformatics sort of biomedical community, of, of publishing these assertions. And you could treat, you give them a DOI. You could get some credit for them. You could also track their kind of provenance. Some people saying things like individual figures could be a publication. We kind of almost do that at the moment. If you publish in, say, a PLOS journal, you're figure gets a DOI. Um, and maybe this might be a mechanism for um, annotating databases. So if, say you, say, you go to a website and there's clearly a problem with that data, it might take you a good day or so to figure out what the problem is. So I, I go to Jibra sometimes, and there's a dot in the wrong place, and I go and read the literature, and I discover there's some weird synonymy. You do a bit of scholarship, and then that's a lot of work. Wouldn't it be kind of nice if I could then sort of bundle those two things together and say, I fixed this record, here it is, blah, 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 DOI, citable unit, done. It gives me some credit, it, it publishes that bit of work that might otherwise kind of vanish. So I think we're going to see publications change quite a bit. Um, we're now also seeing people are publishing data. So in many ways, data, I think data is probably far more important than publications. So. If you think of GenBank sequences, so apart from the fact that some are wrong, so a GenBank sequence from 20 years ago is still valuable and still be used. If you read the phylogeny paper that used that for 20 years ago, it would be hysterical. Um, it, you couldn't publish that today, but you reuse the data. So maybe we should be thinking about publishing data. That would be the thing that we sort of care about. So I think all of this is kind of in, in flux, which makes it kind of interesting.
Yeah, it gets, it gets ugly real quick, um, particularly if you're going to do it geographically, because I guess if you just get multiple kind of lines. So I guess that visualization works really well for a fairly restricted geographic scale, or things are kind of widely spread out. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe I guess there's other things you could do. You could maybe draw polygons around various things. Maybe you could imagine polygons around the tree on the on the map, and as you zoom in, that then resolves into a tree. The kind of levels of detail thing. So if you're looking at Google Maps at the moment, when you're far out, you see country names. You zoom in, you see more details. So maybe we could do something something like that. Um, the thing the thing that I really want to do with that kind of visualization is. Um, click on a dot and sort of see that dot and all the kind of sort of local phylogeny sort of highlight and sort of see at a glance who's this connected to. Is this a cluster of closely related things or is it the nearest relative to the other side of the world? Something like that. So I think there's all sorts of little, as you say, it's all about the kind of visualization and discovery. I think that we don't pay enough attention to this idea of fooling around with the data and having a look. So, so this is a challenge which I tend to run away from in a sense because versioning is hard. And I guess this comes back to the whole idea of can you replicate exactly that kind of result. So there's a whole movement on science about being able to exactly repeat somebody's analysis, which sounds really good but it's going to be really, really difficult. So, and the dirty secret behind GBIRF is, for example, you can get a DOI for a data set you download. The DOI implies that that's frozen in time. GBIRF can't store all that data. So you may come back in a year's time and click on that DOI and you won't get that data set because it's changed for the kind of reasons you sort of talk about. So I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Unless, unless for example, you could grab all the data used at that particular time for a particular analysis you did and freeze that, then somebody can repeat what you did. But I think it's going to be the nature of the beast that if you come back at a later date, you might not get exactly the same data. Um, I guess what always interests me in those sort of discussions is how much does that matter? Because it, it, people always get hung up about versioning. I'm not sure how much it really matters. So for example, Wikipedia is versioned. Does anybody ever, ever cite a version of Wikipedia? Or do we just give a link to the Wikipedia page as it currently is? <laughs> so versioning is clearly an issue, partly because it means I don't have to think about solving it. It does seem like, is it a, as big an issue as, it, as it, people make it out to be?